Welcome to the Teaching Your Toddler Show. Today's guest is Hillary Robinson. She is an author, radio producer, broadcaster, and feature writer. She was born in Devon and was brought up in both Nigeria and England. She is the author of over 60 books and is best known for the mixed up fairy tales. Her books have been translated into a number of languages across the world, and now she lives and works in London and Yorkshire. She is going to talk to us about her newest book, 10 Little Yoga Frogs and the story behind it. Please welcome Hilary Robinson to the show. This is Mary Jo Tinlin from Teaching Your Toddler, and today we have a very special guest, author Hilary Robinson, who is going to talk to us about one of her new books. So Hilary, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, hello, Mary Jo. Thank you for having me on. I'm really honoured, and it's just lovely to be able to chat to you and to your and to your listeners. Um, my name's yeah, as you said, Hilary Robinson. I'm actually uh, a BBC producer, and I've worked for the BBC over 30 years and in independent television and radio as well. Um, but when my daughter, my eldest daughter, who's now 30, when she was born. About the age of two, she developed a real fear of spiders, and I couldn't find a book about a friendly spider. So I had worked in children's television, so I knew a little bit about writing for children. And so I decided to write my own story for her to help her. And that's where it all began. It took me a while to find a publisher. It wasn't straightforward. And, uh, and eventually a publisher did take it. And they brought out four books in that particular series, and that's gone on from there. So Sophie's now 30, so that gives you some idea of how long I've been writing. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes. And, and that, uh, but that's was, been, I mean, that was back when, you know, publishing was different than it is now, right? I mean, that you, like you said, you had to find a publisher. Absolutely. You couldn't just do it on your own. Like so many people can, you know, self-publish now, but you, you really had to do it the, the traditional way. That's right. So it involved literally mailing off the story to different publishers and waiting for the reaction. And as always, <clears throat> I got a lot of rejections, as so many people do, but I never give up. And um, I always see it as a challenge rather than a setback. And eventually, <clears throat> as I say, one publisher did take it. And that publisher paired me with an illustrator called Jane Abbott. And Jane already had an agent. And a year after that book was published, that particular publisher uh, folded. And so I was back to square one, actually, even though they'd taken on other books in the series, I was back to square one. But Jane's agent then represented me and we found another home for those stories. And I'm still with Sophie, my agent now, all these years later. So 26 years, in fact. So um, <clears throat> all's well that ends well. And uh, and I've gone on writing alongside my media career uh, throughout the whole thing. But I still do specialise in picture books and books for toddlers as well. <clears throat> I have written two more books for an older audience, but picture books are my main focus, really. They're the ones that I really enjoy doing. Your new Bronte book is for mm -hmm. preteens, teens? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a bit of a lockdown project for me. I've always been interested in the Brontes and not so much their work, although I've always been interested in their work. But but I was fascinated by them as individuals. And in learning about them, I, rem I, I learned so much about their father, who was the most extraordinary man. <clears throat> he was widowed and left with six young children. He did have some support in the house in the form of servants and um, his sister-in-law, but ultimately he educated all those children himself and broadened their minds and opened their minds. And he was a real pioneer of social reform. He was sponsored through university. He was born into poverty himself. He was sponsored through university by um, <clears throat> William Wilberforce, the anti-slave trade campaigner. And he um, he really helped people and he often broke with the traditions of the time to make sure that women had certain rights and that kind of thing. And I think they he really informed his daughters and his son's thinking. So that story was one that I'd wanted to write for a long time. Uh, and I've done it from the point of view of their long standing servant, old Tabby Bronte, who would have they called her old Tabby Bronte in the uh, village. She would have seen and heard everything. 
and so I've done it in Yorkshire dialect and um, and I've made yeah, I've put across quite a lot of information which I think probably wasn't known by many people about Patrick Bronte so that is the most adult book I've written oh but my it, goodness that one sounds fascinating yeah. I want to read that one I'm gonna find that one. Oh my mm. goodness that's that. so kind yeah well I had to put a, a translation at the beginning because of Yorkshire dialects and uh, I had to I'm not even from Yorkshire but I've lived here a long time so um, some of my friends acted as translator for me so there is a dictionary there for words that you might not recognize <laughs> oh how neat is that that you got your you know your your community involved in the book too how cool is that that's amazing it's been great well, so I know that you've also written a lot of mixed up fairy tales. Now, how did you come up with that idea of sort of the mashup of, of different fairy tales? Well, I'm always looking for unusual ideas and takes on, uh, and approaches. And I had worked with an illustrator, a well-established illustrator called Nick Sharrett, on a book called Spells and Smells. And that was a mix and match book. So um, children love it because they don't realise really that they're reading. And um, and I, I said to him, maybe we could do the same formats but with fairy tales. But I said, I don't think I can make it work over a spread and the spread being the left hand page and the right hand page. And he said, well, it, perhaps if you just condense it down to the left hand side, the right hand side could be pictorial. So that. That book came out, I think, in 2005, and it is still in print. And, you know, every now and then people question fairy tales about reinforcing stereotypes and so on. But I think people recognise them as fairy tales and use them also as a means of being, to, being able to explain that it's not like that now. And um, the great thing about mixed up fairy tales is that children are encouraged to make up their own stories, to understand that there's a beginning and a middle and an end. And they can create their own fairy tales by mixing up four different stories. And when I go into schools or do workshops online, as we're doing at the moment, um, I have a little um, workshop that I do where I encourage children to mix up just two fairy tales. But what I always do is I always try and get them to think of the ending first, which is something that I often do. I think about my endings first. That doesn't always mean to say that the endings stay like that. They often don't, but it does give me a direction to work towards. So quite often in my mind, I will have my title <clears throat> and I'll have my ending. And children seem to quite like that format because otherwise they'll just sort of drift through a story and then say, and I woke up and it was all a dream. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, convenient endings like that. So by getting them to think creatively about their ending, it really helps them to structure the story and then I get them to do it in um, component parts so if it's a very young audience then they would do it in four spreads if it's a slightly older audience it's in eight spreads and 12 spreads for older children and in fact if they're particularly capable <clears throat> we extend that to them writing paragraphs and chapters so that format works across the year groups in so many ways and they're comfortable about it because they often know their fairy tales and what I've learned is that the gingerbread man <laughs> seems to be the most universally popular fairy tale. And I don't know why that is. And that is really interesting. <clears throat> so they mix up, say, the gingerbread man with the ugly duckling and they think of an ending and then they go back and they create the story. So it works on several levels. It works on helping them with their um, writing technique, which is then adaptable to other types of writing in later life. Because even now I will think about my ending first if I'm writing a newspaper article or a feature or something like that for a magazine. <clears throat> and it helps them to enjoy reading and with younger children to actually turn the flaps, the pages and to reveal a new turn in the story. So it was something which was a bit of an experiment at first. And as I say, it's fairy tales on the national curriculum here in Britain. And it's just gone on and on and on. So it's lovely to see it still there and out there. <clears throat> I love that it has so many more meanings than just a story. Like you said, it's teaching them to think creatively, to, to structure their story. And, and, and also, you know, yeah, just, just kind of think out, outside the box or non-linearly -linear, or something like that. That's, that is really cool that it's so much, so much more dynamic than just a book. So tell us about your new book, 10 Little Frogs. 
Right, well, <clears throat> people often say to me, where do your ideas come from? And often I'm not absolutely sure. They're just sort of stored away, away in the ether of my mind. Um, it can quite often be something that I've heard and seen, um, a conversation that I've listened to, things children say are often quite funny. Um, but this particular idea came about because I had to go to our local gift shop in the next village and sitting on the shelves were these ceramic frogs in different yoga positions and they were also selling a few picture books and they don't normally sell picture books in the shop and they know me and what I do and I said to Anne the manager oh are you selling picture books now and she said only if it's linked with the merchandise so I noticed there were there were no books linked with the yoga frogs so I came home and I can still remember the moment. It's one of those that's imprinted on your mind. It was a sunny day. My family were around the back of the house having barbecue. And I just sat on the step at the front and I phoned my illustrator, one of the illustrators that I work with, who I, is a particularly good friend. And I said, Mandy, I've got this idea about yoga frogs, 10 little yoga frogs. And I think I could combine it with numeracy. And I know that she's such a brilliant illustrator, she would be able to make it fun. And she said, oh, that's such a good idea. So it was one of those where I actually find working in rhyme quite easy, really. So it didn't take me that long to, to work it through. Then there's always a tweaking that goes on. And then when you collaborate with the illustrator, there's certain things that they may want you to say because it ties in with what they're saying, what they're drawing. And... Um, the very first publisher we tried with that loved it and um, so they took it because I think it taps into so many things it taps into exercise and yoga and mindfulness it taps into numeracy and literacy and artwork and um, it's just a fun rhyming story and they loved it so much they even came back and asked us if we, we could adapt a partridge in a pear tree the 12 days of Christmas to 12 little yoga frogs but we've changed it to 12 little festive frogs and that comes out later this year so it has been really fun to do oh an extension that's great yeah and I'm doing one uh, in pairs as well so instead of counting uh, in ones we, I've done the story where the frogs are in pairs as well so that one's on the agenda and then I've done another one where children are encouraged to count backwards from 10 to 1 instead of Ooh, counting up to 10. that's a good concept uh, wow well, to turn, I can't remember whichever way around it was it's the opposite way so um so it's different ways of looking at numbers and of course my mother who's now sadly died two years ago she was a mathematician oh <laughs> so it honors she, her yes it does I mean she was remarkable she taught high-risk prisoners um secure prisoners in some of our most secure jails she taught them degree level maths and statistics and I often think now, gosh, I wonder what she'd think about me writing a book which incorporates sums, which is what she used to call maths, actually. So, um, yeah, it does honor her. That's right. Oh, it, do you have an interest in yoga or was it simply the, the yoga frogs were super cute? Well, yoga frogs lend themselves well to yoga. Frogs themselves lend themselves well to yoga movements. And Mandy is really keen on yoga. She does it with her husband every day. And um, oh. I do something which is called functional patterns, which is not exactly yoga, but it gets the body moving in such a way as it doesn't put stress on the body. So in some ways it's related. And um, so I'm always interested in forms of exercise that will not cause an injury or aggravate an injury or be a stress on the body. And yoga and functional patterns really are closely aligned like that. And in yoga itself, I think a lot of schools these days are using yoga for mindfulness, which is great. And um, so it's got so it, that book works on several levels as well. Absolutely. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> well, that sounds what a great inspiration that you were just standing in the shop and there and there were, there came your idea. That's that's really that's really cool. That was where it came from. I mean, it. It can come from all sources, really. And um, quite often I, I say I'm percolating. That's the word that I use. I've got ideas that are sort of rumbling away. And Mandy, the illustrator, describes it as bouncing a ball before you serve at tennis. And that's what it's like. I'm forever bouncing balls. I must have a sort of very distracted look on my face most of the time as I'm wandering about. 
But um, that's how it's <laughs> that's how the mind works. What a great mind. analogy. Yeah, With the bouncing ball. That's that's interesting. I I know I I get a lot of ideas when I'm driving for whatever yeah. reason. I think maybe it's because I I'm sort of zoning out. You know, and part of my brain is zoning out. Part of my brain is focused on driving. I don't know, yeah. but yeah. I know exactly what you mean. And, and taking a shower, it can be anything really. It can be lying on the beach. It comes in all sorts of places. And some people are very. Um, sensible and write these ideas down but I tend to just store them and the ones that really um you know sort of nag away at me if you like they're the ones that come to fruition so um that's how it works for me how they keep popping up in your brain so I know that you spent a bit of time in Africa as a child do you see that influencing your writing Yes, I think I do. Um, I can't quite put my finger on why, but I was exposed to different influences compared with children that perhaps have lived in one locality. So um, growing up in Nigeria at that time and during the Civil War and being in contact with other expats from different countries, Americans, Australians, New Zealand, Swiss, Malta, Britain, uh, India, um, been around children from different backgrounds as well there's lots of different influences and then contrasting that with coming back on leave um to the south of England which is very which was very rural we went back there because my mother's family were there then and so that used to be our our place of base if you like that we'd return to um when we came back on leave and then going back out to Nigeria and these contrasting cultures was quite remarkable and I think that had a lot to do with it and then also because we were there during the Civil War, and at one point it was very difficult, and um, there was a curfew in the evening, and we couldn't really do very much except read books. We didn't have a great deal. It was a little bit of a cultural desert in some ways, so we only had books that were given to us. You couldn't really buy them out there, and some American missionaries had given us the Cat in the Hat books, and this was new to us because I don't think Dr. Zeus was in Britain at that time. And that Dr. Cat in the Hat really changed my life because I found it extraordinary that somebody could create a story with so few words that was so powerfully creative and yet had a moral twist at the end. And I was fascinated by this. And in some ways, it sort of tied in with the way we were living. These two children that couldn't go out in the um, Cat in the Hat book um, was a bit like us, really. We couldn't go out either. And um, and then this cat comes in and causes mayhem. And outside our front door, there was a civil war going on, which was pretty brutal. We had to hide our nanny in the house because she'd been attacked. And, um, you know, it was just such a I don't think that those influences are bound, bound to affect you. And I saw Judith Kerr talking the other day. She was a well a few years ago. She was a refugee she wrote when Hitler stole pink rabbit and also Shirley Hughes who wrote the Alfie stories who grew up during the second world war in Liverpool during the blitz and both of them said that traumatic childhoods or being exposed to trauma I wouldn't like to say my childhood was traumatic and I wouldn't say it was particularly but I was exposed to a war soon so um tends to inspire children creatively and it comes out in different ways whether that be drama music art whatever and interestingly enough there was another family out there in Nigeria at the same time as us and there were a family of six children and one of those is now the um, director of the National Theatre in London so it does make you wonder whether having been exposed to that sort of environment and and meeting so many different from people from different backgrounds that have different approaches to life and different outlooks does broaden your mind. So I would say it's probably a combination of that, of, of what we were being exposed to during the Civil War, um, these inspirational people around us, and then contrasting that with coming back to a farming village <laughs> in Dorset in England, and then going back out there again to, to that environment. Um, I think it, it was A, inspiring, but also I think it... Um, opens up your mind to what is also possible. And so there's no constraints when it comes to creativity. What a wonderful way to look at that. That is, wow, yeah. 
Yeah, I think um, I do wonder sometimes. <clears throat> They say that children hide trauma or it, it's sort of instilled in them, uh, you know, it's sort of hidden within them and comes out in different ways. I, I remember the day that Grace, our nanny, left. And I remember the day, actually, that she was, we were hiding her. My parents took that decision to hide her and she had her ankle bandaged up and she was kneeling at the window. That is imprinted on my mind as a tribe was going past. It was tribal warfare. That was the problem as the tribe was running past, wielding axes and so on. And I can see her now bobbing up at the window and my parents hiding her in my sister's bedroom. And um, and then her leaving us. And my parents, they didn't exactly lie, but I don't think they ever heard that she got back home safely. They put her on a train to Port Harcourt to go back to her parents. And I don't think they ever heard from her again. So we don't even know if she got back safely or not. And I think to some children that could have caused them big problems. Well, it would have done. But I think the fact that I had this ability to write meant that I could express how I felt. And when I was 10 and back in England, one of my teachers said to me they thought I would be a writer. <clears throat> and I, I think I must have believed that. And so when somebody shows faith in you at such a young age like that, you believe it's possible and because my father was an academic writer as well I knew it was possible to, to get books published then I suppose in some ways um, that's how it's all come out if I didn't have that creative outlet I don't know how it might have affected me absolutely right and isn't it interesting as it kind of wraps back to the beginning of our talk it was you you told the story of the brontes from the servant's point of view that's that's interesting that you sort of chose that voice um after what you just described that's fascinating that is interesting you pick up on that because i've never associated it until speaking to you mary jo so i'm sure you're right because we had tremendous respect for both we had another nanny after that who was uh, quite wild in comparison. She taught us, she taught, she took us to all the places she wasn't meant to take us, like the African markets, and she taught us how to speak Hauser, and she was great. Grace was um, brought up by missionaries, and she was very anglicised in her approach. But all the help we had, um, and my parents were very broad-minded, and they encouraged us all to regard everyone, no matter what, as equals. And that's always that was always their case throughout life. So I do know in the case of Tabby Bronte, old Tabby Bronte, after five of Patrick Bronte's children had died, he was reluctant to let Charlotte Bronte get married and she wanted to get married to um, the curate. And Patrick didn't really want that to happen. And it was Tabby Bronte that went in to speak to him and said, if you don't let her marry him, it will kill her. And I've never forgotten that. And I thought that is a servant in a powerful house of highly intelligent people dealing with common sense. And she went in and said it to Patrick Bronte. And he then allowed Charlotte to marry the curate. Oh, <laughs> that gave me chills when you said that. That's amazing. Yeah, the servant's voice is so important because they see and hear things that other people don't. They're grounded. They're not distracted. They've got to deal with practicalities. And so what they say and what they think and how they deal with things is valid. And um, so maybe there was a parallel there. I've never thought about it before. I think there's an article there. Thank you for inspiring me. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad I could help. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Hillary. This oh, this has been fascinating. I would love to just continue to talk to you. And and, uh, and I, I do hope that the listeners, I will leave, of course, the link to your website on in the show notes. I hope they'll look at also it, in your bio, you've got a little story about your life. It's sort of told in a, in a story form and a storybook form. And uh, it's, it's really, it's very interesting. So I hope people will check that out. Hillary, how else can people find out more about you and your books? Well, quite a lot of my books are on sale in the States as well. So Gregory Goose is on the loose was sold to an American publisher. Mixed up fairy tales, Barnes and Noble have taken that. And um, the website is probably the best source because it's up to date and it's got um, all of the books listed on there. I think all of them are on there. Um, and then, of course, there's online stores as well. If um, I'm, a great, I'm a great supporter of local bookshops. I think they're a valuable part of our community. And if it's not available there, then to go online and uh, there's various sources now. So, um, and anybody can contact me from the, via the website as well. And I do write back to everybody. So um, 
if anybody's got any feedback or would like to say anything, then I'd love to hear from them as well. And it's been such a joy speaking to you as well, Mary Jo. Thank you so much for inviting me onto your lovely podcast. So we do wonderful work that's appreciated by so many people. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Bye now. Bye now. This has been the Teaching Your Toddler podcast with Mary Jo Tinlin. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you'll find us on our website at www.teachingyourtoddler.com, as well as on Facebook at Teaching Your Toddler, on Instagram, and on Twitter at Teaching Toddler. So join us again, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you so much.